Philip did some interesting calculus. Jesus caught him on the hop, but of course that's what happens when you're testing people. The test was simply, Philip, what should we do here? Philip felt for any lump in his pocket, wasn't there. I mean, any time the disciples got some money together, the inevitable result was that Jesus would say, give it away. So there wasn't any treasury to speak of that the disciples watched over. And he looked down on the crowd, and of course this is the prelude for the story where Jesus multiplies the loaves and feeds quite, well, feeds the whole crowd. But the question we're going to consider today is when do you have enough? Jesus, again, Maybe he didn't catch Philip at his best. It was just a conversational thing, and he didn't say, Now, Philip, think about this before you answer. Mm -hmm. He said, Philip, where are we going to find enough to feed all these people? And Philip goes, Well, let's see, we don't have a treasure. If we did, it would take six months' pay of a worker to give everybody enough for a little. Philip doesn't say as much, but the conclusion he reaches is fairly clear, fairly instantly. And that is, Lord, we can't feed them, therefore we shouldn't feed them, we shouldn't even try to feed them. Well, why not? Is it just a matter of expense? Well, it does say they didn't, it, it, it doesn't flat out say they didn't have the funds. We can kind of presume that. But Philip is simply ruling it out from the beginning. This is something to which we cannot lay our hand, Jesus. It's beyond our means. Now whether they had the money or not isn't known for sure. But what is known for sure from this text was there was an intentional decision to not try. Philip doesn't even shoot the question back to him. Lord, I don't see a way. Do you see a way? That would have been a response that would have left open the possibility of faith. But again, it was all about a test of Philip's heart versus Philip's brain. What did he know versus what did he try? And Philip calculated that he didn't have enough. <clears throat> and so did we. All the time. We might even say that we have a better excuse for calculating that we don't have enough than Philip did. Because I don't know that Philip had a thing called a television communicating daily, constantly, about 15 minutes out of every hour that you don't have enough, Philip. But we do. We have that very thing. Enough is an elusive thing. Uncle Scrooge, he never had enough. Is enough enough for our next meal? Well, if we're paying rent to a landlord, our landlord doesn't think that enough is enough for our next meal. Enough is enough so we can pay the rent at the end of the month. Well, is enough enough for a couple of years? Not that any of us have a couple of years squirreled away for a rainy day. But, you know, you get into, you ever sit down with a financial advisor? Somebody wants to, you know, and they say, well, let's see, if we assume that you'll live to 95, how many people are doing that? Well, do you want to be caught not having it? Well, no, no, okay, so we'll assume I'll live to be 95. And it's, well, then, uh, you know, you got this many years of retirement, da, 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 da. And then if interest isn't good enough, so your input needs to be, what? And they give you a figure, it's like, 
a fourth of what you make or a half of what you make or if you're planning your retirement a little too late in the game, twice what you make uh, and then you'll have enough. Now, I was thinking about my dad in 1948 and he's a man who felt that he had enough. Of course, he was raised to think that way, but he had a home. He knew where his next meal was coming from. He had a job. He was going to school, and he had a car. The car was 10 years old. That's a 1938 Kerr Plymouth, I think. Um, but he had a car. Now, by 1968, our whole society had managed to raise the bar in America. Now you need a stereo. If you're male and under 20-something, then you'd better have a high draft number. And those of you who don't know why a high draft number is good, just find somebody older in the room. You need not an old car, but a new car. You need freedom to break the social norms of high society, if that's who you want to define. You need to be able to let your hair grow long if you're a guy, or take your bra off if you're a woman. <laughs> or you need to be able to define Jim Crow if you're socially conscious. And that was very important to have enough in 1968. To have enough today, well, uh, gee, I could probably call on people and everybody would know, but, you know, we all need flat screen TVs. We all need stock portfolios to get in on the one part of the economy that, that is unambiguously soaring, the stock market. We need iPods for everybody in the family. Oh, I bought that one, but you know what? I got an iTouch, show. he's got an iTouch. I listened to mine the whole way up from Kentucky the whole way back down again. Keeps me awake on the road. And of course, she likes hers too. Oh, and cell phones. Cell phones for everybody that's old enough to pick it up and dial numbers. Not old enough to dial numbers? Set up the speed dial, parents. That's what enough sort of resembles right now. Now, I could tell you, I could laugh you off and say, I don't need to fit in. I don't need this society's notion of enough. I don't need a flat screen TV. I don't need a faster computer. At least until they build one. I'm a child of my generation. I was raised to know that enough happens when I have the very latest, the very fastest, the very newest. And that's right for cars, electronics, or much anything else. There is a lot of money to be made by convincing me that I don't have enough. There's not as much money to be made as when I can convince somebody who makes a lot more money that they don't have enough is, I mean, I can fleece them for more. But if we create a system where we consistently teach people that whatever you got, you don't have the latest, you don't have the greatest, you don't have enough, then you can look forward to fleecing anybody of everything that they have. And if they have it, sell it to them in a different color. <laughs> so that's it. The definition of enough is redefined in this day and age. For every one of us here. So that enough is something you will never have. Because if you ever had enough, you wouldn't need to part with what they want from you in order to have more. To have newer to have greater, to have best.
We never get to have enough. It's by definition set beyond our reach. There will be never enough to meet my needs as I have been fully, constantly, and persistently educated. I will never have enough. And therefore, what is my mind prepositioned to do when someone else comes along and says, we'd like you to give? How can I do that? I don't have enough as it is. Well, maybe I could. And the HP commercial comes on. Oh, I really wanted one of those. Please give. Well, I don't have enough. Maybe I could. And that car goes zipping by on the TV. <coughs> if we never have enough by constant and persistent design, we will certainly never have enough to give any of it away. I have been, you have been, everybody that is in the reach of marketers has been taught that they need. Even if you don't think you need something, you will be taught what your need is. Lord knows, you know, I used to ask, <clears throat> I remember when I was first doing confirmation class, they, they had this one uh, set of commercials, and, and it's like, well, you, you can't go on a date if you don't have the right toothpaste. <laughs> what do you do if the brand that fits doesn't? You know, we have all of these things bombarding us with who we should be, what we must need, and we are, if, 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 if we somehow have been raised in a way where we don't think that we're stricken down with lack, we are informed that, oh yes, we are. No matter how much money you have, no matter how many cars are in your driveway, you will not have enough, according to somebody, some marketer, somewhere. And if I try to have enough for me, I will never have enough for anyone else. It's a system designed to fleece me of my last dollar, to take the last dollar you have, and guess what? When I get your last dollar, or a modest interest rate, <laughs> I will loan you more dollars than I might have as well. I know, not exactly in this <coughs> But what does seem to be sort of a surprise is when somebody gets us, sits us down and points out how we have been manipulated, how we have been used and abused, we kind of get up. Umbrage, you know, it's how dare they? How dare that bank do that to me? How dare my credit card do that to me? And I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm a product of my environment. I'm not pointing the finger at somebody else and saying, oh, now if you just look like me, you wouldn't have these problems. I, I wish. Oh, I wish. And I am getting some stuff squared away, sure. But um, we have all been taught incessantly to feed the hole. The hole that is enough, that is ever widening, no matter what we put down. So until I choose to walk away from this whole system, I'm trapped. You're trapped. Every one of us here is trapped in a system that is reinforced one minute out of every four that 
we have our television on. I'm not sure what the figures are for radio. And we're trapped every time we so much as look at the tail end of somebody who's got a pair of jeans on that costs $100 and we recognize the label. We're trapped when we look at the shoes somebody else is wearing. We're trapped when we look at their jacket. We're trapped when we walk in their house and we see their furniture or look at their car. And we're trapped every which way that we can be because maximizing our entrapment maximizes profits for those that want to keep us trapped. And by the way, those poor suckers are trapped too. I mean, they're trying to buy their Beamers and their Mercedes with the profits that they get from trapping us. It's quite circular and it's quite endless. What do we do? Well, a few brave souls say, I am going to pull myself out of this system. Now, if this nightlight decides that it wants to no longer be trapped against the wall and tugs and tugs, completely pulling out of the system is pretty scary. We, we, we see TV specials about people who live in the woods. So, I'm not exactly saying, well, let's just wash our hands of all that we are, of all that we've been taught since we were this high, and etc., etc. How well is that going to work? It's probably going to be very, a very dislocating experience of, of incredible size to us. But we can, at least, think about it. We can, at least, be a little more aware. Wait a minute. This isn't a commercial. This is a trap. This is soliciting my soul, not just my wallet. And when something resembling charity comes up to me, it makes me completely paralyzed. How can I ever give to anyone or anything, however noble, however just, however right, when everything I know is that I don't have enough as it is? Well, it challenges our beliefs. But it's not challenging our belief about God. This isn't a theological thing when I say we've got to rethink what we believe. Because it's not what we believe about God so much as what we believe about our world. Do I believe that when I give you something, I have less? We've all in this room been taught but that calculus is self-evident. It's like asking if 2 plus 2 is 4. Well, of course it is. Well, we are the church. And I'll tell you that innumerable times, 1 plus 1 is 3. We experience time and time and time again that what we are together is more than the sum of our parts. It's called synergy. Do we believe amidst the prospect of synergy that what I give reduces me? Or do we believe that what I give makes us Richard, this is the big choice. This is the teeter-totter. This is maybe the test for Philip. Well, Philip, do we try? Oh, then we'd have less. And we couldn't give much anyway, Lord. 
Let's walk away from this one. Now there are some who say that Jesus didn't miraculously multiply the loaves, but that Jesus set the example, taking what bread they had and giving it away, got everybody else to pull that baguette out of their sleeve that they were hiding. And when they shared it all out, everybody had more than enough. I personally am sort of in the faith group that says Jesus tore it, tore it, tore it, and there was always bread. But I'm intrigued with the notion that Jesus, in fact, inspired great giving. Uh, out this way, or yeah, whatever works. Jesus believed that what was given away gained for all. Well, today's our stewardship Sunday. Do we excuse ourselves from the needs that this place has for ministry? <clears throat> Do we say we don't have enough to support this place? You're right, you don't. Because enough has been redefined, and we all know what it's been redefined to more than what you got. It's absolutely clear. Everybody in here doesn't have enough until they have more than what they got. Ask any feature of our marketing capitalism society. Or we can decide to do what we can. And we can say, I'm going to forego all my notions of enough to give that which I told I don't have to do that which is of surpassing worth. We can be the ones that swim up the stream against the current and achieve that which Philip says we can't do and shouldn't try. We can do that in ministry and in all other forms of charity where the world says, are you kidding? If you do that, you will have even less than enough. And we can say, I believe that when I give, I become part of that which is more.